Hello, my name is Jeremy Antley, and uh, I'm making a recording of a talk I gave uh, recently at the Canadian Game Studies Association. It was a really great conference, and uh, if you check out the hashtag uh, CGSA2017, you should be able to find a lot of the uh, other tweets on topics. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to have on their website also the, uh, the program, and uh, it was really great. I saw a lot of incredible speakers, a lot of really interesting um, just thoughts being tossed out, and it was really cool. A lot of a lot of great perspectives. So I was really happy to have my uh, proposal here to talk about labyrinth accepted, and so I wanted to record it for people because uh, I thought it'd be interesting for other people to see maybe because I also really enjoy the topic. I think there's a lot here to discuss with labyrinth, uh, and especially the expansion that came out, uh, labyrinth the awakening, and uh, so I just want to kind of dive into that here. So what I'm going to be basically be giving is sort of a a repeat of the talk I gave, I wrote a little script, right? So hopefully it won't sound so wooden because I'm now just doing it in the, uh, the comfort of my living room, right? And not necessarily in front of a bunch of people. Although it went really, really well, but uh, I, I thought it was awesome. But uh, you, know, you know how it goes for when you're doing it by yourself. So anyway, we'll just start off here. Today I want to talk about what it means to uh, expand the labyrinth. In this case, I'm talking about GMT's Global War on Terror board game, Labyrinth, shown here. But first, some background. Uh, released in late 2010, Labyrinth is a two-player game depicting ideological and physical confrontation between the United States and jihadist forces. Uh, the rulebook states that Labyrinth simulates at the strategic level the ongoing bid by Islamic extremists to impose their own brand of religious rule on the Muslim world. The core thesis of the game is uh, centered on the idea of governance, and the U.S. wins by increasing the governance of Muslim countries, which uh, presupposes that uh, having good governance would suppress uh, radical interests or sort of suppress the, uh, the uh, causes or, or the things that, that make that conductive, right? The radicalness would center around it. If you had good governance, it wouldn't exist. Or the U.S. Should, uh, could win by eliminating all the jihadist cells on the map. The jihadist player seeks to destabilize uh, the Muslim country governance on the map and also U.S. prestige in an effort to promote uh, Islamic rule or they attempt to resolve a weapon of mass destruction plot in the United States. So here's a map of a solo game I played shortly after Labyrinth was released. This is only a portion of the map, but it shows the main area of action. Tan cubes are US troops, black cylinders are jihadist cells, and many countries are rated poor for governance. You might be able to tell this US player I conducted a regime change in Afghanistan and made it a poor ally. It started off as an Islamic rule adversary. The U.S. can attempt to improve governance through uh, wars of ideas roles, while the jihadist player can destabilize governance through the execution of terror plots that may or may not involve weapons of mass destruction if the jihadist player can first secure such weapons via Islamic takeover of Pakistan or, as we'll see later, Syria. Labyrinth, Labyrinth received critical acclaim upon its release. Rex Brynan over at Paxims wrote that while I could quibble about some of the politics and descriptions, it should be said that Labyrinth is an excellent game. Taking it into account caveats, I also think it could be used in some interesting and useful ways in some instructional settings. Matthew Kirschenbaum over at Play the Past wrote, Despite its many aspects that call out for critical scrutiny, I believe Labyrinth has been good for the strategy gaming, demonstrating the vitality of board games for exploring material that big budget computer games can't or won't touch. So if Labyrinth was a critical success, why attempt to craft an expansion? And what does it mean to create an expansion for a contemporary war game? At the most basic and obvious level, events began to immediately age the simulative model at the core of Labyrinth. The Arab Spring began in early 2011, and Labyrinth players took notice. Over at Consum World, one of the more popular online forums for wargamers, an anonymous player noted that, quote, the momentous events in Tunisia and Egypt might make for an interesting expansion card, end quote. Over at Board Game Geek, another player asked, what are the odds of an expansion pack, noting that it's hard to ignore the protests in the Middle East as having an impact on the game? For a game centered on improving or destabilizing governance of Muslim countries, the events of the Arab Spring immediately demonstrated gaps in the highly abstracted simulative model. For these players quoted above, the current events of the Arab Spring and beyond spurred excitement that new cards or new mechanics could be created to update Labyrinth. Yet more importantly, these players, uh, these players' observations introduced fundamental questions of whether or not Labyrinth could continue to provide insight on contemporary events. And these were very important concerns because they spoke to the relationship between player and war game that became solidified with the introduction of Kriegspiel in the 19th century. Play of a war game yielded practical, usable knowledge that could be directly applied on the battlefield 
not highly abstracted lessons in strategy and critical thinking that previous war-themed games like Go or Chess promoted. Instead of having to learn firsthand the dangerous lessons of combat, a junior officer or ranking general could test out new ideas on maneuvers or tactics, validate or disprove larger strategic notions, and even taste the agony of defeat without suffering more than a bruised ego instead of a broken or mutilated body. While I could go on for quite a while about the history and impact of Kriegspiel, the important point here is that commercial war games, which are several times more abstract than their military counterparts, still seek to maintain this connection between play and producing usable knowledge. So on the left, we sort of have a picture here of a, you know military men or gentlemen perhaps playing a game of Kriegspiel right in the 19th century. And on the right, we see uh, sort of the, the Rand employees a war gaming on a scenario here, right? Um, so here we see employees of the Rand Corporation engaging in the play of war games, uh, seeking the same insight that the chief of the Prussian General Staff von Muffling stumbled upon when he observed an 1824 demo of the original Kriegspiel and exclaimed, this is not a game, this is training for war. Clearly, if Labyrinth wanted to maintain the connection between play of its model and the production of usable knowledge, it would need to expand in order to include events of the Arab Spring and beyond. In late 2016, GMT released just, a, just such an expansion, Labyrinth, The Awakening. But if we dig deeper on why it's important for war games to maintain this connection to usable knowledge, we can begin to see war game designs as reflective of and instructive towards the societies from which they spring. Indeed, we might see Labyrinth as a modern progenitor of the type of imperial heuristics Megan Norcia investigated when looking at puzzles and dissected maps produced for the children of the British Empire. Norcia argued that these puzzles and maps taught children who played with them not only the extent and range of British rule, but also the sort of role those children would play as adult administrators, workers, or soldiers in such an empire. Putting together a puzzle map of far-flung India became an imperial heuristic that informed even as it entertained. In many ways, the play of Labyrinth is tied to the same process as described by Norcia, designed for a Western audience who most likely possesses little direct knowledge of the conflict depicted. Labyrinth's ab abstracted model introduced geographical knowledge in addition to Western-sourced aspirational designs and anxieties for the region. Labyrinth provided a way to become acquainted to the places, personalities, and particularities of the global war on terror. The board war, the board war game thus becomes an addition to the pantheon of war technology, much like the telescope or drone, in that it brings the battlefield closer even as it distances the observer or player from the actual conflict. But this telescopic perspective becomes threatened if players no longer believe the simulative model to be informative of current events. Failure, failure to update Labyrinth would mean co-signing it to the archives, relegating its perspective and the knowledge it brings to that of the past and not the present. So now that we know why Labyrinth required an update, the question shifts to how Labyrinth was updated and expanded. Again, at the most basic level, this update and expansion came about through the introduction of new rules such as this section that governs a Civil War mechanic. New materials, such as these event cards that feature Jihadi John and an ISIS or ISIL ranking member, and especially through new scenarios, such as this one allowing setup to recreate the Arab Spring. Together, these, these additions create a layered effect, which, when applied to the Labyrinth map, allow the model to incorporate events and possibilities not possible with the original design. At a deeper level are techniques used to create these new rules, cards, and scenarios. In my very recent article over at First Person Scholar, I discussed how player-made event cards utilize montage to distill a much larger subject into a Labyrinth event card. Players created new cards because they perceived Labyrinth's model to be lacking. In doing so, they hoped to keep the model current and thus sustain its capacity to serve as an epistemic reservoir and ensure that play continued to produce usable knowledge. So one of the things I want to talk about here is that all these elements come together to produce something that I would call uh, an embedded structure of meaning in war games. And uh, at this embedded structure, we see things like the player, and they sit at the center. And their concerns and instruction that they get comes from and feeds the game they play, just as the game they play has concerns and instruction that comes from and feeds society. This layered structure helps explain how the war game can not only claim the production of useful knowledge, but also take on heuristic capabilities, how it can sort of train someone to understand the conflict uh, from a, the perspective from which it's created. It also explains why players perceive deficiencies in a war game's simulative model and take steps to remedy those deficiencies. And uh, one of the questions I had at the conference uh, sort of said, well, do you see it really like this 
this sort of layered, right, where the player is at the center and the game's there and the society is wider. And honestly, I made this graphic. It's not really a 3D graphic, right? It's a 2D one. I would think these more of like spheres that sort of inhabit each other all the time. But in this way, you can kind of see how the player's concerns and learning comes from the game. But a lot of the game's concerns and learning come from the society. And a lot of that is through the way the designer abstracts different things into mechanics or cards. That's why I used the FPS article uh, to discuss things like montage and... Um, how to make event cards, right? So that's one way to do it. We also have rules and mechanics that do that as well. And, and that's kind of what I'm arguing here for Labyrinth is that it's taking a designer's interest, it's taking uh, the way they interpret the world, and it's creating a, a structure of meaning for the player. And because they detect that structure of meaning, because in war games it's so very important for them to produce usable knowledge. And, and obviously commercial war games are for fun, right? We play them because they're entertaining, but everybody, any war gamer knows the arguments that go down over accuracy or the, the, the fealty to reality, right? Like the ability for it to seem real or play like it should happen in real life. Um, and this is sort of the structure of meaning that comes with war games, right? Okay. So that's what I'm trying to draw with this, um, this, this graph here. So what's new in Labyrinth the Awakening? So to begin, there are 110 new event cards that were created for the expansion. And unlike the original Labyrinth, Labyrinth The Awakening focused a lot more attention on the role of technology in the global war on terror. Social media makes an appearance, a la Facebook, and, uh, as well as the ubiquitous presence of the smartphone. And indeed, the role of the internet became accentuated with cards like PRISM, the secret NSA data sifting program, and censorship, depicting nation-state interference of online traffic, as well as JV Copycat, which mentions jihadist use of the dark web. We see new personalities appear as well in the expansion, such as Jihadi John which, that was shown earlier, and here we have Edward Snowden, for example, shown here as a high-value uh, Jihadist-associated event card. Event cards also depicted updated locations, such as Tahir Square and even Ferguson. Spaces are almost always affiliated with one side or another, and uh, for those who are not familiar with Labyrinth, uh, the event cards come in basically three flavors. They come in a US-associated, a neutral stance, and then a, a Jihadist-associated, right? Spaces are almost always affiliated with one side or another, while personalities tend to be depicted as neutral, with some noted exceptions like the Snowden card, and having two possible outcomes depending on which side plays them. The idea that space can have permanent affiliations while personalities can assume a more neutral stance, able to either be pro or con, suggests a powerful constructed image of the region and personalities in question. Tahir Square, Tahir Square will always represent a Western notion of freedom and support for the correct kind of popular uprising, while personalities like Jihadi John are seen more as more questionable and ill-defined in a conflict that increasingly blurs the lines between forces involved. So in addition to new events, Labyrinth the Awakening uh, altered the map itself. And before examining those changes, I think it's important to keep in mind a quote from Rachel S uh, Simmons, the designer of Napoleon's Triumph, from her contribution to Zones of Control. She says, There is no organic connection between the hex grid and the battlefield terrain and the grid can easily reduce the terrain of an actual battlefield to the powerful geometry of the hex itself. So one of the things I think is really also interesting about war games is the way they use something I would call uh, the, the Borges uh, map uh, logic. And if you know this little short story, uh, Borges was a, a fiction writer, and this is a short story he produced. And, and uh, to sum up this story, or it's not that long, but to sum it up, essentially it says that in this one fictional universe or kingdom, there was a, cartography was a really hailed art, and they kept making more and more detailed maps. And eventually they produced such a detailed map that it was a one-to-one -one facsimile of the empire itself. And then eventually they grew tired of making maps, and the people turned away from cartography, and the map became shredded and, and lost in the desert. But the idea here is that the drive to make increasingly real maps leads you to cover the subject increasingly so until you almost approach a one-to-one -one facsimile of what you're trying to recreate, and that's sort of what he's talking about here. And I think with expansions, and particularly in war games, I've seen other examples too, right? That especially with contemporary ones, and even historical ones, there's a drive to sort of expand the map, expand the scope, expand the range of the game that you have in front of you as a player because you want to include uh, things you think are important or things that you want to see the game logic sort of spread further out. So I call that sort of the Borges map logic uh, or Borges map effect that I think really does go down a lot. And we'll see it here also happen with Labyrinth uh, the Awakening. So to begin, Labyrinth the Awakening added two new nations. We have Mali and the dual natured Nigeria. And uh, this begins, Nigeria begins the game as a non-Muslim country, but can transform under certain circumstances into a Muslim country subject to U.S. regime change and alignment efforts. 
it's actually possible to have Nigeria flip several times between non-Muslim and Muslim status in a single game. Two other nations received makeovers, uh, not necessarily additions, but they are changed, little mats you put on top of the map itself, and that's Syria and Iran. Now, Syria is interesting because it switches from being a Sunni-dominated to a Shia mixed designation. Uh, for, again, for those not familiar with the game, Muslim countries are designated either as being those two categories, uh, either Sunni-dominated or Shia mix, and some cards affect that. There's other things that designates it for, but that's sort of an important marker of what kind of religious designation a country has. So Syria switches and also receives two weapons of mass destruction markers, markers that were assigned in the original labyrinth to former Soviet states assumed to be ripe for loose nukes. So we also have Iran, and that's once a... The, Iran in the original game was a special Muslim country that the U.S. could not really mess with or send troops into, but with the expansion, it now has the ability to become a regular Muslim country subjected to all the U.S. and even jihadist whims with the play of the Iranian elections event card. So it turns into a regular... A Muslim country that can either be switched over to, again, Islamic rule or become a U.S. ally, depending on sort of the focus or attention that's brought after that play of the event, right? Another new change brought about by Labyrinth the Awakening expanded the solitaire mode of play. Uh, the original game shipped with just a jihadist bot, a flowchart that could act as a competent opponent for those who played alone, but this meant a solo player could only be the U.S. A uh, conceit GMT uh, admitted was due to the sensitive nature of the conflict and the thought that few would actually really want to play, or at least solitaire play, the jihadist side, right? But Labyrinth the Awakening introduced the U.S. spot. And even more interesting is that the example of play provided with Labyrinth the Awakening uh, describes two of the bots going at each other. Players have called this sort of bot-on-bot -bot action null play, and it has interesting implications that is more suited for a critical code studies perspective than the media studies frame of reference used here. And, and what I mean by that is to say, it's interesting to, to take strategy and intent that the designer wants to have the model have and then create a solitaire bot that uh, either closely or casually mimics that, st that style and that strategy. And, and we won't go into how they can do that. I think that's really interesting. I think it's something that is becoming really popular, especially with the GMT games, is to have these sort of solitaire bots. And I find it really fascinating. And it could, it could be its own a whole talk, right, is how these bots go down and how you program them, so to speak. Um, but here we have a really great example that even the, the player aid here that shows you how a, a typical turn will work in um, Labyrinth the Awakening. It just says, hey, we're going to do that, but we're also going to make it a bot-on-bot -bot, you know, playoff. And that's really interesting to me, too. Okay. So, of course, no war game would be complete without scenarios, and Labyrinth the Awakening added seven new ones for players to explore. What's interesting about the expansion scenarios is the way some have incorporated attempts to place the game more or less on a chronological track mimicking the development of historical events uh, using seeding of the event deck to power that the event deck that usually the players basically use to play the game. Okay. Here we have instructions for seeding a deck to recreate the Arab Spring, if you'll see on the right. Uh, note how events such as smartphones, popular support, Facebook, and Tahrir Square populate the first list while Militia, ISIL, and Jihadi John populate the second. Scripting may disturb the sandbox appeal of the original game and that events can unfold in novel configurations but it allows players interested in recreating the perceived pace and structure of the historic popular uprisings to do so with minimal fuss. Here we have two more examples. One is an old history prompt to act as if Romney or McCain won their respective elections, and the other is a very interesting two-turn scenario which lets both players select 15 event cards of their own choosing, uh, with some other cards are included, to create a common deck, and the goal is to either take Syria to Islamic rule or make it a good governance ally for the U.S., right? And, and what's interesting is you could, in theory, select the cards for both sides and then let the bots duke it out, as we said before, a twist on the idea that algorithms can provide insight into our world and its operation. So in conclusion, and returning to my original question of uh, what does it mean to expand a contemporary war game, you can see several layers come together to produce an overall heuristic effect. If we look back at the embedded structure of meaning, we can see how new rules, new event cards, changes to the map, and new scenarios all contribute to give the original Labyrinth model new life and sustained relevance. You know, using techniques such as montage and Borea's map logic, Labyrinth the Awakening seeks to reaffirm the production of usable knowledge through play and provide for Western audiences a means by which they can get closer to the conflict and reflect on the hopes, dreams, anxieties, and fears instilled in the Western psyche vis-a-vis -vis the global war on terror. As a parting example of the means, uh, on the means by which the embedded structure of meaning works in war games, I want to provide this photo found on BoardGameGeek, showing off the expansion in action with its new map tile for Syria 
and new rules governing its game state. So Siri is depicted as being in a civil war, with the blue cylinders representing militia members, and we can also see that an Islamic caliphate has established itself in the war-torn country. Uh, this player is experiencing firsthand the sort of updated heuristics found within Labyrinth the Awakening, and exclaims in a pithy statement that, quote, Syria is getting crowded. Who knows if Labyrinth will continue to receive periodic updates or expansions, but one thing is clear. So long as war games maintain their connection between play and the production of usable knowledge, perceived gaps in their simulative models will continue to inspire new rules, new materials, and new expansions. As reflections of the culture from which they spring, board war games deserve greater attention and analysis. So that's sort of the talk I gave. I um, am working sort of on, a, on Labyrinth in general. The first person scholar article I wrote was a, a, an exploration of sort of the, the part one of like expanding Labyrinth, that is the player calls for doing it. This sort of is exploring part two, which is uh, going to be how it expanded and the sort of what it means to expand it. And then I want to plan a part three that sort of looks at what the changes are between the two models and sort of have a nice little book into it. So we have the pre, middle, and end. But um, yeah, so this is my talk. If you have any comments, please leave them below. Um, and thank you for listening.